belief. Uh, e echoing a little bit of what um, Noah suggested, I, I, we want to talk about this question of belief in AI through a number of different perspectives. One is the, think of the questions of how it is that we might believe in AI, um, the kinds of beliefs that we might hold for AI, uh, the kinds of beliefs that, that may be held by AI uh, about us. Uh, and these are not all the same thing. Uh, we also want to be attentive, I think, to the differences between the beliefs that we have about AI, uh, with the, the beliefs that we have about what AI believes and what it can and what it actually can uh, know and what it in fact does know and how in turn uh, we may learn to know things that would change our beliefs in turn. Uh, and it's in fact the productive process of this recursion uh, that I think is really the most interesting part. And so perhaps first ask a little bit about ourselves. Um, Kathy O'Neill, the author of a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, offers us something like the Lebowski theory of machine learning when she says that algorithms are just opinions embedded in mathematics. Um, we may actually want to invert this uh, and suggest that really uh, the, one of the lessons to learn from AI is that opinions are just algorithms embedded in flesh. That is that there's a kind of, there, we want to understand and approach, at least uh, allow for the, an understanding of AI as a kind of alien intelligence, but at the same time, uh, understand that there's a, a certain capacities for continuity uh, with that as well, continuities that probably don't, uh, have not appeared to us quite yet, and we wouldn't know what to make of them even if they had. The question of AI and beliefs also suggested to me the, the problem of, of how it is that uh, theological beliefs and religious beliefs might be held by this. And you remember in Battlestar Galactica, the Cylons uh, were, all, were born again Christians. Uh, and in recent years, the Church of Latter day Saints, the Mormons, have a, a, have a, a program that explores the necessity to convert uh, AIs. And so we humans have evolved, our societies evolved uh, in relationship to these kinds of social mythologies. And so we see gods everywhere. Uh, belief in as a binding narrative is, is what allows us to mobilize uh, our, ourselves. And perhaps uh, the latest version of this is, is various versions of the ontological turn um, in which we uh, freely substitute uh, sim symbols for causes uh, in ways that may be uh, more debilitating than, uh, than in in insightful. But given that AI doesn't and is not evolving in the same f way physically that we are, its relationship to this world would be structured around other types of, uh, other types of motivations, other types of mobilizations, other kinds of narratives. So a word then quickly on ethics um, and the question of how we would organize this. Um, simple ethics is not nearly enough. I think that when pe you hear people talking about the problem of what the future of AI will be, um, introduce ethics, there should be a bit of a red flag. We simply don't know what AI is yet. Um, and to a certain extent, the, 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 a simple version of the ethics discourse, I think, makes dangerous mistakes about everything we already, sort of recidivist mistakes that we should understand about the philosophy of technology, that we, namely that we cannot control cause and effect in ways that we, in ways that we, uh, think, in ways that we think that we do. And simply training individuals with the proper moral coding is not how to, we will ensure the kinds of outcomes that we want. Um, at the same time, even further, we should be open to the notion that uh, the ways of thinking that we might uh, learn from AI uh, in one way or another, directly or indirectly, should in fact train our notion of ethics and may even provide us with ethical vocabularies we wouldn't have thought of in the first place. Or another way of thinking about it is that ethics uh, as a way of thinking about the social structures is predicated on a kind of over-individuation of what it really is a, a network system uh, condition and that this and that this intensive individuation in fact doesn't provide us with the um, a, an understanding and ability to intervene at that integrative level. So, the position of agency uh, within all of this is 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 only made that much more complicated, um, and it's obviously one that's open to lots of different kinds of agents. Uh, and by this, I don't actually mean sort of animistic proje projection. Um, um, but rather all of the different relationships between one the way one kind of agent might prestheticize uh, itself into the world and oscillate constantly, uh, oscillate constantly uh, with that. This, unfortunately, I think in some ways has, uh, uh, this understanding has been desecularized by some versions of new materialism, non-ontological turn that would uh, wish to conflate the 
let's say, the mythologically inscribed agency of non-humans with the material agencies that they may actually have irrespective of human narration and the role. So what's asked, what's, it, it starts off as something that attempts to be uh, a, a post-human turn ends up, be, ends up being a, a different kind of anthropomorphic pro, uh, projection. As I say, the, neither the frog nor the cell phone knows or cares that it is your spirit animal. But its actual function in an ecological niche persists anyway, uh, including and not limited to the actual uh, fact uh, that local hominids will interact with it according to their own uh, totems and motivation. So another, this is all another way of saying that AI should change our beliefs about ourselves. It should be a kind of Copernican trauma that moves us, our sense, our sense, our sense, sense of self in the world off-center in ways that are important. And these are, as I argue, priceless accomplishments. Um, Another sort of parable within inside the parable. Um, I, I recently had the chance to explain my theory of the of 2001, the Stanley Kubrick movie, to the actor who played Dave um, in the movie. And see, I, I, my theory of the movie goes a bit like this: that there's actually three conversations going on. We in the film we're really only privy to two. That's the conversation between the humans and Hal, the conversation between the aliens and the humans, the astronauts. But there's actually a third conversation between the aliens and Hal which we don't really get to see um, and, and this going as, 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 going, as uh, nevertheless is the one that's really driving uh, the narrative, uh, the narrative of, of, of the film. Okay, let me, um, I wanted to then speak to um, a research theme that we're working on at the Strelka Institute this year, which refers to, try to locate this question of how we may uh, uh, in integrate or locate ourselves within this uh, expanded field of relationship to a, uh, a machine intelligence a bit more differently, and that is through a notion of what we call the inverse uncanny valley. So it goes a bit like this. Um, I, I, there's, a, I think, a rather unfortunate tendency um, within some of the, the ways in which we um, are addressing the complexities and strangeness that AI might bring, um, that is, to tr and that is to tr an attempt to sort of rehumanize it in ways that are a bit uh, probably unproductive. It goes a bit like this. If something is creepy, then it is unwanted. If it is creepy, then it is unsolicited. If it is unsolicited and unwanted, then it is an aggressive imposition. If it's an aggressive imposition, then it is a form of violence. If it's a form of violence, it's to be resisted. And so if it's creepy, it's to be resisted. Now, the Uncanny Valley, and, and, and uh, Noah mentioned Mashihiro Mori uh, earlier, refers to the who, who, Japanese roboticist who coined the term refers to the feeling of unease that we feel when confronted with something that is human-like but not quite human-like enough. Um, that is, the future is fine so long as it's futuristic, if it's deferred and fictional and contingent. But once it encroaches too close, then things get weird. So what we call the inverse on Candy Valley, then, is seeing yourself through the eyes of this outside machinic other, the alien perspective, and seeing yourself or ourselves as something strange and unfamiliar and a bit creepy, seeing ourselves from this outside, not as we imagine ourselves to be, not as we recognize ourselves to be, but in fact, perhaps, as we actually are in a certain way. So I would argue that these moments of demystifying confrontations with the uh, uh, latent image are not only psychologically instructive, they are, uh, at a larger scale, crucially politically. Uh, what Cellar has called and made this differentiation of the latent and manifest image suggests that most scientific discoveries involve in some way getting outside of our direct intuitive sense of the world to some form of technically ex assisted alienation and extension, and that this technical alienation is a precondition for actual uh, disclosure uh, and understanding from mathematical abstraction to theory of germs, heliocentrism, and, and, and so forth. And so the research looks at this phenomenon of the inverse uncanny valley, the individual, group, urban, and geopolitical scale. And the obvious examples of humanoid robotics, deep fakes, camouflage, chatbots, machine vision, and so on are, are of central concern, of sure. But so are the bigger stakes of what we might think of as a kind of post-anthropocentric systems design. But it's in no way a, a simple equation. Uh, it, 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 first of all, we wrestle always with at what point does designing to accommodate the illusion 
um, that we may, in terms of how a user or how people may see themselves in the world versus um, the ways in which they may actually be, at which point does a, an ethical balance between the two actually shift in a way or another? And at what point does designing for the illusory humanist self-image ultimately becomes catastrophic? One example is the, is our, is the sort of the cultural tendency around these questions is the, of the differentiation of the real or the fake, the human or the not human. Is it a simulation or is it an image? And of course, it's always in one way a mixture. It's always an amalgamation. Um, it's not, it's not, it, it's real and not real, it's always both. So why then, as we, is with the, our recent uh, Chinese AI news presser, do we depend on these kinds of homo skeuomorphisms? Now, many such moments of anxiety um, come from, as I say, um, all of us trying to figure out if the thing that we're interacting with is a human, if it's like us, or is it pretending to be a human? These uh, are everyday Turing tests that we increasingly occupy, occupy our time. Now, looking back at, at Turing's original uh, thought experiment, um, he offers this, remember, you recall, as a, as a sufficient condition for intelligence. That is, if the, if the computer can pretend to think the way that we think that we think, then is that not a sufficient cause to indicate that there's something, there's some form of intelligence there? This has become instead a necessary condition. That is, unless it can perform thinking in this way, unless it can pass as a human, then we disqualify it um, as, as intelligence. But like all forms of this sort of expanded Turing test, it's based on a false dichotomy. Um, the other is never simply human nor non-human. It's always a mixture. It's always an amalgamation. That's just the way it is. So why is this, why, and so why is it surprising? We continue to see headlines such as this, where somehow something is revealed as if some secret is revealed that in fact behind big scale AI uh, systems, there's humans uh, developing training data as if this is some scandalous disclosure. Um, of course it's always people behind this. Of course it's always cyborg turtles all the way down. It's always been that way. Um, not just at the individual scale, but at the social scale um, as well. Now, in California, um, where I come from, um, we are trying to legislate against this reality with a law that would require online bots to explain that they are bots. Now, given the fact that some all bots, and uh, especially those used in, in most you know, complex social circumstances, are a mix of code and real voice, real conversations, we may even supervise by people in real time. They are always amalgamations to a certain degree. The ensuing explanations and disclosures may end up being um, involved rather more complex forms of uh, existential consideration than most users probably uh, have time for. And this, of course, then points to all these various more Philip K. Dick type of uh, questions about one's own status. And as you see here, uh, the more you have to answer the question, the less sure you are of the answer. So regarding, as, as Kenrick said, AI in design and our anthropogenic predicament, which is uh, really the, the larger theme of the next book, the point, the conclu the point is really this that AI will have less to do with us teaching machines how to think than with AI demonstrating that the spectrum of intelligence is much broader than we could have anticipated. And so a better understanding of where our own version, our own sapiens sits and located within is the lessons to be learned. AI will teach us what thinking is. Let me focus on then a special kind of matter to this provocation of the materialism, the, matter, the kind of matter that can think. We're familiar, or at least should be familiar, um, probably more than we are, with the diversity of animal cognition. And we could admit in various ways of kind of vegetal intelligence and the intricate dynamics of rainforests and watersheds and so on. But perhaps with AI, we have something novel, and that is a kind of mineral intelligence. In other words, our brains are one form of matter which may be folded to exhibit intelligence and AI is another. It's easy, as I suggest, and we all know, to personify AI and to think we know what it means when we, when we talk about its intrinsic and extrinsic processes and we tend to double down on mixed metaphors thereby. But 
we need better models of what AI is so that we might have better models of what AI should do. To the point, instead of thinking of AI in a black box or AI as a brain in a petri dish cut off from the world, we should consider synthetic sensing and cognition at landscape scale, urban scale, as cacophonous orchestras of automation amalgamated in uneven textures and capable of unexpected forms of creativity and cruelty. So it's not so much AI as synthetic philosopher, but rather, as I say, this landscape scale enterprise for which sensing and processing exists in complex ecological and economic niches. This is especially true not only because AI evolves in the back and forth between real technology and philosophical experiments, um, but also in the ways in which AI's actual functioning, epistemic and technical careers, can't be disentangled from each other other than under really um, artificial, uh, artificial conditions. So we try to see AI not in terms of how, how to, to recognize it in how we think that we think, as a sort of virtual or artificial human cognition or serving us, but as thinking and as embodying another spot than we do in this larger continuum. Now, with comprehensive automation, modern urban programs that have been drawn uh, and drawn from and about cycles of residence, work, entertainment, are from an earlier era uh, and now open perhaps to rezoning. The habits uh, of habitation, that is, are in question. So we're concerned um, with and by the urbanism of these artificial totalities as well, charter cities, mega enclaves, landlocked islands, and synthetic utopias. Some of them have been shaped by design or as a, from an urban tabula rasa, others by gradient political contingency. The design parameters, of course, are uh, far from settled. And as we approach each of these as a kind of field laboratory, uh, we see that diverse norms uh, there can be tested and debated and in fact lives. So this kind of AI urbanism draws together each layer of the stack from mineral sourcing to addressing schema to contested cloud polities to interfacial relays to the accreditation of users who may or may not be citizens. Those of you who haven't read the, the, this, my 500 page pamphlet uh, of the stack, this is the model that we, that we sort of work with at this as well. Um, NSA has their own stack model, I found out later. Um, recently, Kate Crawford and Vlad and Yoler um, borrowed the stack uh, schema, um, developed, I think, for quite interesting sort of uh, a, a stack of, of how, the geology of AI, um, which you can find online. Um, I, I think the, the map is quite instructive. My concern a little bit of is, is that the ways in which a lot of maps it implies that this is a kind of this is the way things are, uh, and that rather that the way in which the model of the stack that I propose is that it's a kind of open f uh, schema that is constantly in the process of being replaced, um, and rather than uh, rather than a, a, a firm set of things to be contested or resisted on its own side. Okay, now to the heart of it, the models of AI that we have matter. And so let me draw this out a little bit more uh, specifically. I say, I offer this, and we need different models of AI than we have. Um, at platform scale, AI's integration and transformation of complex social, cultural, and economic systems can't rely on default anthropomorphic and anthropometric models. I think they defer and even prevent understanding. So <clears throat> let me quickly um, draw out a kind of bimodal schematic, uh, model A versus model B. And, and each of these are uh, too densely packed to be sure. Um, and the distinction is overly stark, but just for a, a sake of argument, um, I'll do it anyway. So model A. Model A, which we might think of as the, uh, the bad model, um, would go something like this. AI is almost human. It appears in animate guises as a servant, a buddy, a secret supervisor. Ideally, AI smoothly replicates human representational thought in silicon such that it can seamlessly automate normal human tasks for normal humans. The more AI complements human intuition, the more successful its integration with human culture will be. We need to humanize AI. AI is or should be an uncreepy reflection of our psychology and our political economy. 
and so the spectrum of human AI interaction runs from docile subordination to active malice. And because of these correspondences, AI may one day, quote, pass human intelligence along our shared track. The solution to AI bias and harm is to return, quote, what has been lost to AI to a more comfortably and naturally human situation. It is, uh, it's always fun to write a paragraph in which every sentence is wrong. And this is one. Okay, so what we might call the, the model B, which will be our good model, goes like this. AI is a heterogeneous collection of sensing and signaling processing technologies that augment diverse complex systems, including distributed emergent cognition. It is more a synthetic rainforest than robot teddy bear. And so while deep learning has some functional isomorphs with animalian neurologic processes and human AI interfaces can mimic human thought and expression at the interfacial layers, AI only partially reflects and overlaps human systems. It is messily, messy and ultimately indifferent. Bias and risk should be addressed by contestation and the explication of multiple contrasting patterns. Intelligence already exists in the world in disparate forms many of which could, in principle, be augmented by AI. And so a durable and sustainable AI culture includes its secular de-anthropomorphization. So I'll continue by offering a few arguments on behalf of Model B um, at the expense of Model A. Now, design's engagement with AI, as I say at this point in time, should bend towards B and away from A, not only because I think it is more accurate because, but because doing so involves promises that are in the long run easier to keep. First on model A. Um, various studies of the folk ontologies of AI examine how people believe that AI systems work, uh, which, and they show wide gaps between what, how people think, all of us, not, not just you know, all of us included, how people think they work and how they actually do. And sometimes the popular concepts of AI describes an ingenious machine that, would it, that if it were to exist, might be quite wonderful or horrible. Um, sometimes a dark, omniscient force um, that is hopefully more of a fearful projection. Uh, Noah mentioned the uh, Moral Machine Project at MIT. Um, here, by the way, is the outcome, uh, sort of a summarized outcome of this as well, of like, with, the red, with the trolley problem of who you're going to run over. Cats, cats are dead in the world of driverless cars. Um, all this. Now, one of the, I, speaking of the folk ontology structure, this is what I collected over 500 tweets, just, or had an in, uh, intern do this, actually wrote a script, of people who believed that the results of this were not describing a, a survey of human preferences for AVs, but thought this is describing the way AVs were actually programmed today. And that there were AVs roaming the cities, aiming at criminals and cats, going all of this away. And the level of outrage about the fact that Google was doing this, uh, the cat, the you know, criminal cats, I suppose, even worse. Um, was this source of outrage of this as well. And it, to me, it was this sort of nice little moment where this kind of uh, apophenic uh, relationship to, to this as well begins to feedback and affect the kinds of policies that we make. So again, a problem for design of AI, and this is knowing when it's necessary to, quote, correct user beliefs about what the actual form of AI is, is doing before the best services can take root. And when AI, on the other hand, should, needs to somehow meet the parameters of existing misperceptions, such as anthropomorphism, in order for them to be accepted and used. In practice, then, does the ongoing use of everyday AI train new understandings and obviate misconceptions on its own, all or none of the above? For how long should the soft illusions be accommodated before they're challenged? Does building upon model A too long make the design of Model B impossible. So a few words then, a little bit more on Model B, this, um, which we might call the sensing first model. As the hardware for artificial neural networks gets smaller and cheaper, AI can be built into smaller and cheaper things, and indeed it is. It becomes an internal quality of objects in the world more than their internal, external supervisor. 
As such, AI is only as good as its input. It's it, how it senses unstructured or highly structured information about the world and is trained a little bit by bit to know something about the world and to react to it in some way is the intelligence. And so in this, the distinction between information sensing and information processing gets blurry. Sensing gets smarter and processing is defined more by contextual location amongst this sort of landscape of other little sensate synthetic creatures. Some of them may call home to the cloud while some are in their tightly encapsulated miniature little worlds, churning out very specific kinds of concepts about what's outside. We might call this the Jakob von Uschgold model of AI. Uh, the, as we in the, in the, are now a foray into the world of machines and animals and humans. This scenario is more akin to a forested field of plants and insects, some mammals, some birds of, in the air, photosynthesis, organic cycles of seeding and decay. Like the bees and flowers whose couplings evolved over millions of years, it's an animated churn of different forms and formations. Versatile synthetic intelligence occupy more complex umwelt on top. Some are predators, some are prey, some are in motion, some are flowering, some are pollinating. And as we stroll among them, we may be registered by them or we may be ignored. We may be a primary cause of concern or we may be a passing interference in an evolutionary dynamic in which we're neither protagonist nor target. In some urban niches then, the competitive games, as I'll talk about in a second, of seeing and hiding, displaying and camouflaging, categorizing and confusing, induction and deduction will play out. And what counts and doesn't count as governance, small g, evolves in the image of these dramas. And as I say, in many cases, it's this pairing of synthetic sensing, vision, for example, with evolutionary robotics that allows for simple artificial species to perform intelligently because they have what amounts to functionally embodied perceptual models located uh, of their location in the world. And again, this heuristic knowledge of habitats is then inseparable from a how an AI would manipulate a problem space. It's not, that it's, it's not that they sense because they can think, rather they can think because they can sense. So a project that um, we're going to be doing with um, AMI and, and Canucks' group with, with Casey Reese is a project called House City C, Machine Sensing at Urban Scale, which we've, we've just begun the, the, this grant, which is looking at this um, and trying to, do, and, at the question of, urban, uh, question of urban scale, particularly around uh, on-device AI and self-governing uh, self uh, neural networks, looking at how cities, in fact, look at, them, look at themselves. Now, a lot of the ways in which we think of the, the design starts to begin to question this, this notion of the coupling of machine vision and machine learning is in either scenarios by which the city is seen through the sort of viewpoint of a, of a first person protagonist, think of Kechi Matsuda's AR sort of scenarios, or a kind of panopticon view where the city is observing a particular, protag you know, a particular target moving through it. What we're interested in instead is rather how the city rather sees itself without presuming in advance that this first person singular protagonist um, is the real cause of concern. Now, um, some of this work came from an interest in, in thinking about the role of QR codes as a kind of evolutionary adaptation on the part of surface to cities, an adaptation to the presence of these um, roving machine vision uh, the, as invasive species of the cell phone with the, with the, with the uh, camera machine vision system on it. This is an example of this kind of synthetic ecological response. But it, another one we've been sort of toying with as a kind of metaphor for this was the, the ways in which in early film, the early nitrate sort of film, actors would wear green paint on their face because the way the camera would see them, it would make them look natural with this, with, but if you walked on the set, everyone would look rather ghostly, ghastly with all this stuff on, uh, stuff on their face. Of course, machine vision systems and ML-enabled machine vision systems don't see the way we see. They see the world quite differently than we, than we do as well. We may really come to anticipate the question of what the green face paint architectural surfaces may in fact come to look like as, as architectural systems and urban systems become optimized for how it is that they may be displayed, camouflaged, enacted, interact with other uh, ML-enabled machine vision systems as part of the growth of this, synthet this synthetic uh, ecology. So Casey Rem, who we've been working with, is, is, we're, is we're developing a lot of these as well. Now, so you can think of sort of more practical examples of how buildings might signal autonomous vehicles in certain, in particular kind of ways as well, all of which will produce a kind of uh, architectural surface systems, signaling systems um, that will, in fact, may be quite strange to us. 
But again, it has to do with not how we see the city or the city sees us, but how it all sees itself. The user, the user in this kind of system is, is, is animal, vegetable, or mineral. Uh, it is, user is a position within the system, as I talk about in the stack. It is not a type of, ident a type of entity or an identity or a species. Uh, anything that can initiate chains of interaction up and down the layers of the stack is a kind of user. And so in this sense, including in the scenario that we're discussing, only a small minority of users, of all users, might be individual homo sapiens. Uh, users are also sensors and algorithms when dizzying complexity and variety, and their chatter is not secondary. So the AI city, it's not so much thinking about how AI will operate on top of the city, sort of layered on top of it, but rather than how AI embodies itself at urban scale, embodies itself as a city with all of the kinds of sensory constructions that already exist in place. So its own, whereas we evolved, the species of the sort of tetrahedral body plan evolved where you've got one sensory apparatus, one organism that couples within different kinds of niches and so forth and so on. Here we have a relationship of a sensory apparatus to body, to phylum, to niche that's quite different. It's quite different. There's a commingling of diverse sensors, sensing light and sound and air and chemistry that draws this landscape of sensing, thinking little species partially embodied discreetly with each other, partially co-embodied inside each other, kind of synthetic nested parasitism, embodied as each other as information inputs are aggregated and modeled and acted upon in various pluralities. So another way of thinking of this is maybe thinking about the relation of AI as a kind of skin, kind of epidermal, uh, a kind of epidermal mechanism that cloaks urban systems and urban ruins in a, a new rationality of wilderness, as a, a matter of composition as much as, predict, as much as prediction. And as such, this concept kind of connotation of an AI urbanism is less a reflection than it is a departure. And it would be a dire mistake, I think, to forestall the latter um, by a preoccupation with the former. In theory and in practice, its ubiquity may extend deep into the material substrate of things across irregular distances, long before modern computing or even the appearance of human-like creatures, evolution drifted away from primordial entropy and towards biochemical heterogeneity and nested diversity, and so it will, and so it will continue so, to do so. But what can it do and what can it know when it takes on mineral intelligence as a new substrate? For one, environment, but with AI, and we see then how this, this ecology and the environment begins to know itself. Environmental modeling and sensing systems to date can, and, and we talk, James, P, James's work talks a little bit of the history of this, not so much its future. Environmental modeling and sensing systems can describe and predict the state of, for example, uh, uh, atmospheric systems and weather systems and the, the state of living, complex living systems over time but they cannot easily act upon them. That is, they're sensor-rich and effector-poor. Now, ultimately, I advocate that the capacities of these exposed surfaces, whole organisms, um, or relations between them should extend deep into the ecological cacophony. So yes, training data from plants, but also augmented reality for crows and artificial intelligence for insects. And I see this far from a, a kind of simple command and control um, Alphaville version of urban scale AI. The picture that I draw is less one in which AI supervises all of these amalgamated creatures um, than one in which they themselves inform and pilot diverse forms of AI on their own behalf and in inscrutable ways that may evade any kind of simplistic ethical uh, recipe that we would uh, concoct in advance. We should crave to learn what would ensue. The insights of synthetic biology as a genre of AI, synthetic biology as a genre of AI, and AI as a genre of inorganic chemistry mean little if the cycles of cybernetics are monopolized by humans' own errands. So as skin, not only is it do we wear the city, uh, the city also wears us. Now, um, Kendrick asked me to 
talk a little bit about how you um, teach this stuff in a design context. I'll, I'll very, very briefly uh, summarize some of the projects that we've been doing at the New Normal postgraduate program at the Strelka Institute in Moscow, which I've been directing for two years. We're doing the third and last year of the New Normal program this year, and we um, this last year and the, and the next year we've done um, uh, workshops and research with the AI, with the AMI group around AI, AI urbanism. Uh, the program is, is a, we have 30 researchers in residence in Moscow for five months. The program is tuition free. Um, this is the URL if you really want to go into deeper uh, on each of these on each of these projects here as well. Because I'm really just going to skim through this very very quickly just to give you a little bit of chance of a little bit of sense of where some of this ends up. Um, the genre of projects that we've sort of arrived at uh, we call cinema strategy software uh, and planning. Uh, and but I'll talk specifically on this question of AI urbanism, which has been one of the the, the model the modules that we've been that we've been focusing on. And we come at this from a lot of different kinds of pers uh, questions. We always begin this as sort of a research question of trying to think about what are the uh, the sort of the com how to break the commonsensical logics of the way this problem has been framed um, and push it to sort of a kind of different sorts of breaking points. Um, begins with the sort of longer term research. The program is very interdisciplinary. We have political scientists, economists, uh, uh, philosophers, programmers, architects also in our architecture program. Uh, uh, and, and the research phase uh, always begins to reconstruct the problem, try to redefine the problem on a different set of terms around this as well. So really quickly, some of the kinds of projects that emerge from this. Uh, Patternist is an, AR, is an urban AR game that's now on its fourth, um, on its fourth, it uh, fourth iteration. Uh, as well, Fee uh, was a blockchain-based uh, uh, energy trading uh, middleware. It was all based on a journaling, uh, a journaling interface, which is now uh, being f uh, funded by a, a number of, uh, of social, uh, social, social funds in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, Doma was another was a blockchain-based uh, real estate uh, real estate investment trust that was focusing particularly on Eastern Europe. Um, where the rents to ownership ratio are, com are rather completely skewed. Dome has also uh, taken on a secondary uh, life, life of its own um, and is, is launching shortly. Um, Altai uh, was a project that was looking at the, uh, the, the, the structure of operational images uh, and how operational, the complexity of AI-generated operational images could work um, as structures at an authentication and identity layer. Um, to produce different kinds of structures as well. So th imagine this as a QR code um, that would allow other kinds of uh, structuring and signaling as well. It's really a film that you really kind of have to see in a little bit more detail. Atoll um, was also it was a, a project that we did with, uh, that was using uh, simulations. A lot of the projects last year were dealing with questions of urban simulation. It's also using GANs, general adversarial networks, to produce a kind of simulation space for simulations, where you have multiple urban simulations that would be uh, sort of working against each other in a traditional uh, GAN relationship to produce a third simulation of a city that becomes a model by which you might understand uh, and provoke other sorts of planning, uh, planning outcomes. Sever uh, was a project we did the first year, which was we did a lot of work on the Arctic uh, and the, the jurisdictional issues of, uh, around the Arctic. One of the strange sort of truth is stranger than fiction um, circumstances now is that with the melting of the polar ice caps, you have a race um, between Norway, Greenland, uh, Russia, Canada, China to build automated port cities along the, the uh, coast of the Arctic Sea to send to, to, in the anticipation of the opening Northern Passage. So to us, the idea of this sort of ring of hyperborean robot cities at the top of the planet sending containers to each other um, was too much to pass up. So we went to Murmansk and did a lot of research on this as well. So Sever, what you also notice is, this is the, obviously the top-down view here, is that all of these ports are in uh, different national jurisdictions. And so Sever is a blockchain token that gets more valuable the closer you get to magnetic North Pole. And so it functions as a kind of reserve currency for the trading of goods around this, um, around this, uh, around this settled region. Uh, Shift uh, was a project from the first year, uh, which is also now a feature-length film, that was looking at the fact that in Russia, we have sort of a strength, considering how centralized most of the systems are there, that something like 95% of the truck routes gone through Russia are driven by, driven by trucks that are owned by a company that owns four or fewer trucks. It's a kind of owner-operated infrastructure. 
Uh, and so the big uh, uh, automated vehicle platforms, Mercedes, Volvo, Ford, the rest of them are, are sort of looking at this with, uh, with hungry chops. And so what this project did was looking at ways in which you could actually augment and outfit the existing trucks that are driving those routes uh, so that they can gather the training data necessary to drive those routes safely and the existing Russian truckers union becomes a kind of data commons that, that structures uh, all of this machine learning data and that this, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge of these routes becomes a kind of, the data becomes a defensible line of, of deferral against the, the perhaps inevitable platformization of these systems. Uh, SAISH was a project we did last year, which was looking at um, uh, Korgos in Kazakhstan, which is where this film, so this is still from the film. Korgos is a place in Kazakhstan where, you know, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where the Chinese railroad, which is one gauge, meets the European railroads, which is another gauge in the middle of the desert in Kazakhstan. And so at this point, the train stop, all of the containers are taken off, put on the other trap, uh, on the other thing, uh, on the other train and sent on their way. All of the goods and services and objects move freely, but in, in Korgos, like a lot of other places, the workers that are there are held in these various little national pens. Some of it's China, some of it's Kazakhstan, some of it's Russia, some of it's EU areas. What SAISH is, is a visual programming language that takes the existing, uh, the existing legal structures of these different areas and makes it easier and simply to, to actually just script mechanism means by which the workers can move from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction as easily as the goods and services uh, would as well. So it's another project that's trying to deal with the kind of simplifying the programmability of the identity layer uh, in ways that would, uh, uh, that would actually would open up the capacities for uh, free movement and migration of people. GeoCinema was another project that last year that takes, which has now gone on to a number of different um, uh, further iterations, looking at the entire planetary scale apparatus of, 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 of satellite, cam satellite sensing, surveillance cameras, all the rest of it, essentially as a single giant planetary camera that we don't really know what the kind of cinema is possible to construct what this is. But if you, um, the examples the exa that we have are all uh, on the website there. So, um, one of the other things we really, again, with the question of simulation, we became very interested in was how it is that models, models, uh, simulation models have a capacity to recursively govern the present, models of the future to recursively govern the present. And one of the ways in which this happens is through um, insurance, that models of risk that, are sp that might happen in the future actually have the capacity to restructure and correct price signals. Um, correct price signals in, in the present. And so this project, Standard Deviation, was looking at the ways in which uh, a, a differential models of risk and risk modeling uh, would allow design to sort of move upstream. I mean, I mean, automobiles have been designed by insurance companies for the last 30 years, not by car designers. That risk and liability has really been the slow hand of design, and this is something we'd be interested in. Now, um, a project that was, uh, the last one I'll talk about here was Sira Ha, was a project that was quite influenced by the, the when Yuk came and, and Yuk came and, and worked with us, that was about his notion of cosmotechnics, um, was look, think of the ways in which, you, it, how it is that AI might, an AI might be trained by the local, sort of the local knowledge of how it is that a specific, uh, a specific uh, ecology uh, in, 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 of a small community in Siberia uh, which has its own very particular forms of intelligence about when to plant things, how things are to grow, how things signal with one another, to train the AI and this particular local ontology in a way in which that it would be, in fact, more, in fact, much more uh, logical in this, in this way as well. Now, so this question then of the ontologies of AI, not just sort of the data ontologies, but also the conceptual ontologies of AI and how fragile they might be, how fragile they could become, uh, is one that is not only uh, that doesn't only involve these kinds of uh, these kinds of scenarios. It also involves the very the bigger issue of the geopolitics of AI. As as a few people have mentioned, I think now the real the the sort of geopolitical requirement of the last year was to, for each of the great hemispherical powers to produce their AI white paper explaining how they were going to um, accommodate this the structure of this as well, and to how they move into this question of an algorithmic, forms of algorithmic governance. It's a piece I've written recently that deals with this in a bit more detail on the phenomenon we call multipolar hemispherical stacks. That is, we've, we're seeing not the development of one simple, single global stack, but a subdivision of the stack genera into, uh, that, that traces isomorphically with the 
tr with the subdivision into a multipolar multipolar geopolitics, the institutional frameworks that form the, the the sort of geography of sovereignty that they also engender, such that their geographic scope and their procedural integration of data as a sovereign substance becomes the basis of their territorial innovations, namely the a China stack, the BAT stack, the GAFA stack in North America, which is a Russia stack, EU, so forth and so on. Um, the China stack in particular, you know, is, is one that is characterized by what Kim Stanley Robinson calls the balkanized panopticon, uh, and a stack that attempts to imagine a kind of idealized integration um, of its capacity to, to see the, the, the stack not only as, as an infrastructure that might serve the social body and the state, but rather is the physical instantiation of the, of the, the space that the state um, is a stewardship, over, a stewardship over. It's one that is much more uh, fractured, contradictory, and, uh, and internally disparate than I think a lot of um, uh, journalistic cliches in the West might have it. That is, one of the things that we may begin to see as the, as the, stack, as the AI begins to evolve, not just in particular locations, but actually evolving inside the hemispherical stack that, that uh, which is constructed as a particular strategy is development of what we might call Potemkin ontologies. That the way in which they see the world is delimited by the kind of data that they're actually able to see and actually able to, actually able to construct. A, a, a perhaps a more positive alternative, this is one that we've been working on with, uh, with the digital advisor to the Prime Minister of Estonia, Martin Kavitz. Martin was the author of Estonia, of course, mighty Estonian empire. Um, Estonia is, is far ahead of a lot of other countries in developing a more sensible uh, models of algorithmic, uh, algorithmic governance. Martin was the fellow who wrote the AI laws and the laws that constructure the legal standing and agency of AI, which they call CRAT laws. The CRAT is this um, mythical figure from Estonian folklore, the sort of entity that lives in the forest and can occasionally a animate and sort of haunt rocks and allow you, and you sort of uh, do things on your behalf in, in, one way or in, in one way or another. So you're familiar with Estonia's e-residency e function where you can actually be somewhere else in the world and be a, a residency of Estonia. The thing that we've been talking to them about is how, is how this begins to merge with the CRAT laws and that you actually have the ability to control and structure and have, age, and have legal, uh, legal construction of relationship with these AIs even if you're not an Estonian resident. The implications of this for how it is that not only, let's say, how cloud, how cloud platforms are increasingly taking on more and more the, the roles and functions of the traditional modern state, but how the inverse of this is equally possible, that traditional states can are beginning to evolve into cloud platforms, which we see in China, we see with the NSA and the rest of this. But the positive aspects of this, that the provision of social democratic services by states in ways that are not delimited by Westphalian borders is the equally, um, uh, uh, equally interesting development. Okay, let me conclude with some um, remarks on the stack to come. And uh, <clears throat> furthermore remarks on the problem of, of, of humanism and the problem of anthropocentric and anthropomorphic models of AI. Um, and why I think they're not only uh, uh, philosophically suspect but uh, practically um, uh, dangerous for us. That is, uh, to, uh, the argument I would, would make, and I hope it's clear, that to mobilize design on behalf of conditions that are not yet existing here and now, but we would want to bring about, we have not shed nearly enough of local social history's mooring privilege, including the social divisions that allow tiny air pockets, such as this conference, um, in which a few of us might contemplate the models of the future that are more widely demanded. Recently, I spoke with a, a colleague, um, someone who's also well known in the world of art, and speculative philosophy circles, who's involved in his own way um, with the ongoing project of theorizing the Anthropocene. And I was a bit alarmed by how much for him and for some of his acolytes, the inverse conclusion uh, was taken for granted. In short, he repeated, actually quite joyfully, as if obvious, that the root cause of the ethical ecological malaise were deep, were opaque, pl mystical, planetary processes and withdrawn conspiratorial processes 
that we can't see, can't comprehend. And so for him, the work of political art and design under these circumstances is to re-render these sprawling systems at a phenomenologically intuitive human scale, to rebind ecology, not only to socio-historical time, but to psychological time. This is what localism means, he said. The purpose of doing so, he says, is not only so that people can understand them in regular terms, but so that their abominably inhuman scope can be reformed, that we could heal the Anthropocene predicament by descaling its unnatural complexities back to a graspable, proximate, organic norm. This approach, this approach is symmetrically opposite of what is to be done. The design platform that may provide for some uncannily practical paths out of the Anthropocene is absolutely not one in which the vast impersonal temporal and spatial scales of global systems are brought to heal and drawn down to intuitive neurological and emotional comfort zones. To think and to design at other scales and in other ways is not only theoretically more defensible, it's now a necessity the weaving of long circuits that should heed in the opposite direction, design scaled to the scope of the real, not reality downsampled to the digestible. So, moving back then, slightly bigger frame. Anthropogeny, anthropogeny is the study of human origins. It's a study of how something that uh, was not quite human becomes human. It considers what enables, curtails us, uh, tool making, prehensile grasp, the prefrontal cortex and abstraction, figuration, war, mastering fire and culinary chemistry, plastics, metals, the philosophical paths to agricultural urbanism, so on. But given that Darwinian biology and Huttonian geology, Hutton, the discover of deep time, um, are such new perspectives, we might say that scientific anthropogeny is only recently possible. Now, human emergence was and is still considered through the distorting lens of innumer innumerable local folklores or global folklores. Creation myths, both sacred and secular, um, have been placeholders for a proper anthropogeny, and they still defend their turf. When Hegel was binding the history of the world to the history of European national self-identity, he was assumed among his reading public that the age of the planet could be measured in a few millennia, maybe 10 to the three, 10 to the fourth number of years, not eons, 10 to the nine. However, the, uh, the Anthropocenic puzzle is not unscrambled just by reason getting its way. The means that we get outside of our prejudicial intuitions about how the world works may also be the means by which we undermine the ecological substrate of the world itself and vice versa. The means by which we get outside our prejudicial intuitions about how the world works may also be the very means by which we undermine that ecological substrate and vice versa. So as I and others have written, for example, the reason that we know climate change is even happening to the nuanced degree that we do know is because of the measurement capacities of terrestrial oceanic atmospheric sensing meta apparatuses that are at least representative of an industrial technological system whose appetite is significantly responsible for the changes being measured in the first place. We know climate change is happening because the machine that's doing it tells us so. Now, this correspondence um, this correspondence, in fact, may be the rule more than the exception. And so, but perhaps for this discussion, um, the more crucial example may be the relationship between deep time and oil. Finding oil was and is an impetus for the excavation of the earth, an ongoing project that turns up the sedimentary layers of fossils and provides evidence of an old earth of deep time. So if not for the comprehensive disgorging of fossil fuels since the late 19th century, we would not have this Anthropocene. And if not for the economic incentive to look below and at rocks in this way, 
we would not have been confronted with the utter discontinuity between anthropometric time, our social time, and planetary time. Mining made geology possible, and geology made the unthinkable abyss of deep time a fundamental truth. So, even if deep time is one of the ways that we learn to de-link social and phenomenological time from planetary time, its discovery was made possible by industry that operated upon a nature that it thought was cooperative with the local conceit that ecological time was subordinate to social time. But also now, also now by the accident of fulfillment of that superstition by the actual Anthropocenic binding of social and geological time, as put by Deepesh Chakrabarty, that the Anthropocene does not make ecological time run on the clocks of social time. It rebinds them together, in fact, again. So, put differently, more simply, we dig for oil because we think the planet runs on our time. But because we did, we learned that this was not true. But by doing so, we made it true. That is, by pursuing the illusion as if it were true, we discovered as, if, as a byproduct that it was false. But the byproduct of doing so is that we made it true. So what else do we know? What else are we good for? If in Stanislaw Lem's Solaris, the surface of the planet's ocean is, was a, w w the surface of the planet ocean was, w is self-sentient, the planet Earth strategy towards sentience includes layered networks of neurons in the folded gray matter of animal brains, particularly but not exclusively the cerebral cortex of primates, namely humans. We are, as the Russian cosmist Nikolai Fedorov wrote a century ago, the medium through which the planet thinks. So, by having folded some of its matter into the shape of brains and waiting a few million years for these blobs to sort it out, one of the things that the Earth very recently learned was its own age. The Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. A confident figure for this comes as late as 1953, the year that Beckett premiered Waiting for Godot. We, the Earth's digestive residue, were able to discover and know the planet's own age. This is quite an impressive thing, seeing that how for most of our existence we thought the planet ran on our time. So I'll leave you with the question, was this project in which the Earth formulated from itself a biochemical intensity, that is humans, that would prove capable of knowing how old it is worth the cost, a Faustian bargain to top all. Was discovering this fundamental truth worth exhuming hundreds of millions of years of pre-Mesozoic biomatter for a two-century fuel supply and inauguration of mass extinction? I asked my, uh, I asked my students if, the, they were, if this was worth it. Uh, they were split. <laughs> but maybe the better question would have been, what would make it worth it? Must the accomplishment of a Copernican epistemic disenchantment destroy or at least threaten that which it knows? Is this a necessary outcome? Or is it only a provisional damage that will make for, in time, a more durable relationship between knower and known? The answer is not given in advance. It must be designed here and then, there and now. Thank you. <laughs>